Okay, thank you so much, everyone who um, who participated uh, to this uh, uh, to this meeting or lecture. Uh, let me do the play from start. Um, so this is lecture nine of EE six two eight deep learning course in Stevens Institute of uh, Technology. Um, and uh, a few announcements. Uh, okay, I need to admit one more participant. Okay, perfect. Um, so a few announcements. Um, first of all, midterms are graded. And uh, I push the PDFs to your private uh, repositories. Let me know if you have any questions. And also, um, the deadline for the project proposal is um, April 3rd, uh, Friday, 5 p.m. But if you have any difficulties because of all these uh, strange times, let me know, we can, we can work on it. And uh, this uh, project proposal actually includes the creation of GitHub repository with the README file that contains the summary of the project. So I just ask you to create a public uh, GitHub repository, or if you are shy, you can just uh, share a private repository with me and just explain what you want to accomplish in your project. Uh, and I want you to think about something that actually you can put into your resume. So when you go, when you graduate and when you interview other companies, I want you to use this as a showcase. So please don't think this is like, a, um, uh, is like an opportunity to get a better grade or all that, but mostly focus on how can you show your skills in deep learning to some uh, uh, recruiters or, or companies, okay? And the late submissions or the repositories with empty readme file will lose 30 points. And um, once uh, you are ready, please email me the link of your GitHub repository before the deadline. And the deadline for the projects is uh, April 27th. So this actually includes um, the report that's uh, explained in our GitHub repository for this course. And uh, the project presentation will be in April 30th. Uh, so I needed uh, three days to go over your reports. Um, and then you can also use this, these three days to prepare your presentation. Okay, then you will be done. There is actually no final in this course. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay, I assume not. Is there a question? No, Professor. Okay, so if you are not talking, can you please mute yourself so we don't have the background noise? And I apologize for the background noise I might have here uh, because I'm obviously working from home and recording this from home. Okay, so last lecture, we covered the modern convolutional neural networks. So we started with Linux architecture, and then uh, we discussed VGG, interception, uh, so inception and, um, uh, and ResNet, all that. Um, we also covered uh, batch norm. And uh, then we had the midterm, and today we will cover uh, text processing and re recurrent neural networks. Uh, you may want to, to pay more attention if you are planning to do any kind of a project related to text or if you want to uh, have a career in uh, natural language processing or anything like that. This might be quite useful for you. And uh, again, um, I used to dive into deep learning um, uh, book from Alex Sumala and uh, his colleagues uh, to prepare the slides. And also the GitHub repository for our course is the, in my uh, GitHub account, okay? So you can actually find all the slides and also IPython notebooks that I will discuss in this class in, in our uh, GitHub repository. All right, so why do we need recurrent neural networks? 
so far, um, we encountered two types of data, either generic vectors or images. And um, we also assume that our data is identically, independent, identically distributed. And of course, this is not true for most of the data. For example, uh, the words written here are in sequence, right? The words that you see in my slides are in sequence. And um, you will not be able to understand them if I permit them randomly. Or images, uh, image frames in a video or audio signal in a conversation or browsing behavior on a website. So all these examples follow some sequential order. So we need some specialized model for this kind of sequential data sets. Also, we may not only receive a sequence as an input, but we might also be expected to continue the sequence. So for example, um, if you are doing uh, some forecasting for weather, you may not want to forecast only tomorrow, you may want to forecast uh, next week or even next month. And um, uh, convolutional neural networks, uh, you know, that um, uh, process the spatial information and recurrent neural networks are actually designed to better handle this sequential information. So the way these networks work is that they introduce state variables to store some past information and then it uses the, the current input and this uh, state variable that has the past information to determine the current output. And uh, many of the examples for using RNNs are used on text data. So we will emphasize language models in this lecture, but of course it's not limited to text data. So you can also use it in, in like any kind of time series or sequential uh, data sets too. And uh, we need some statistical tools and need deep network architectures to deal with sequence data. Um, and uh, so let's start with a stock price as an example. So let's denote the price by X of T, which is of course greater than zero. And um, for traders to do well in the stock market on day T, they want to predict uh, what the stock price, which is denoted as X T, will be today. So basically they want to have this probability of X T given x t minus one, which could be the price of yesterday, x t minus two, which is the price from two days ago, and so on. And um, so of course our trader could use a regressor, but there's a major problem, problem, right? So the number of the inputs varies depending on t. So in this probability that I showed in the previous slide, so if, if T increases, then your dependency also increases. And um, so how, to, how do we deal with this um, uh, changing number of inputs? Well, first we might um, uh, use this time span tau and only use uh, tau set of in, uh, observations. For example, you can use xt minus one, xt minus two, and all the way up to xt minus tau instead of using x1. And uh, these models are called autoregressive models um, because they perform regression on themselves. Or other strategy is that you can keep some summary, ht, let's call it, of the past obs observations around and update that in addition to the actual prediction. So basically your model um, uses, uh, finds the probability of xt given xt minus one and ht minus one. And here, ht will use the previous state and also previous data. And uh, these models are called latent autoregressive models. So LSTMs and GRUs that we are gonna discuss next week are examples of this. And in both cases, uh, the question is, of course, how are we going to generate the training data, right? So if you have this text data and let's say you have any of these model, either the latent model where you have this uh, hidden state that, um, um, that actually keeps track of the past information or you have autoregressive model where you have um, 
uh, you use uh, previous observed data set to predict next, but how are you going to generate the data? So the common assumption is that um, while the specific values of xt might change, at least the dynamics of the time series itself won't. So statisticians call dynamics that don't change as sta stationary, uh, uh, stationary processes. So regardless of what we do, we will get an estimate of the entire time series by solving this problem. So probability of having x1 to all the way to xt, we will uh, have this xt given all the previous observations and xt minus one and all the previous observations and all that. And um, so recall the approximation that in an autoregression model, we use only xt minus one to xt minus tau. So basically we use this uh, window that's tau dimensional instead of going all the way to the first observation from xt minus one to all the way to x, x one to estimate xt. And whenever this approximation is accurate, we say the sequence satisfies a Markov condition. For example, if we take this ta or our window length as just one, then we have a first order Markov model and P of X is given by this. So all the probability of all observations um, can be written as a multiplication of these probabilities. So it only depends on the previous one. So this is a, a Markovian model. Um, and these models are particularly nice um, because we can use some dynamic programming to compute values along the chain exactly because of this nice formulation. And um, so in principle, there is nothing wrong with unfolding this probability from x1 to xt instead of xt to x1. So basically, uh, you can compute probability of x1 all the way to xt where xt depends on xt plus one and t plus two. But in many cases, um, there is some natural direction for the data. So basically it goes in time. So in order to um, predict uh, today, it makes more sense to look, uh, look in the past instead of future. Um, and uh, it's clear that future events cannot influence the past. But of course, so basically when this is, uh, this is the case, which is, which is in most of the applications, we call it causality. So there is some causal relationship between your um, inputs. And um, text processing is an important example of a sequence data, as I said. And the common pre-processing steps for text data consist of first um, loading the text as strings into memory, and second, splitting strings into tokens. And a token could be either a word or a character. It's really up to your design. And uh, building a vocabulary for these tokens that maps them into numerical indices, because we need uh, some numerical representation of this um, of this um, uh, text, and then uh, mapping all these tokens in the data into indices to facilitate to feed into models. So we will go through all of this when we have the um, when we uh, start looking at into our IPython notebook. Okay, so let's open the notebook or in class text data example. You can either just follow me or you can also open the notebook at the same time as me to take a look. But I guess I need to share something else now. Um, okay. So here I need to share with the terminal, sorry, with the browser. Okay, so, 
Well, let me let me try this again. Sorry for this. So screen share. Okay. Yes. So do you see my iPad and notebook page? I hope you do. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. So let's open. Uh, uh, which one did I say? Uh, text data example in class text data example here. So I already um, put the utility functions and also uh, the text data that we will be using uh, in this lecture to the to the GitHub repository. So you don't need to worry about uh, finding this. Um, so we will be using this uh, text from uh, Wells Time Machine, which is fairly a small corpus um, with 30,000 words. But for the purpose, purpose of what we want to illustrate today, it's just fine. And uh, of course, more realistic document, document collection contain many millions of words. Uh, and uh, first, let's uh, go through the function that actually reads the data set into a list of sentences where each sentence is a string. And of course, we need to ignore punctuation and capitalization. So for this, you actually need to import uh, these two, I think they are both standard uh, Python libraries. And uh, then, um, so this function, read time, read time machine, it actually takes this um, time machine.txt file that is in the same repository, it, that's in the same directory. And then uh, it, um, it runs this uh, read lines uh, function that is specific to reading files. And then we may want to do some pre-processing. So basically whatever that is not between A and Z, either capital, uh, either uppercase or lowercase, we want to remove them, or we actually want to replace them with some uh, space. And then we also want to strip all these sentences into words. And also we want to apply um, this lower function to make sure that all, all uh, words are represented uh, as lowercase, okay? And then finally, we will call the output uh, as the clean text data or, or lines. So let's run this function. So you see that there are um, 3,221 sentences in this function, uh, in this uh, file. Let's look at uh, line eight, for example. So this uh, line eight actually um, is only one line from this uh, text file which turns out to be the time, the time traveler for so it will be convenient to speak of it, okay? Um, and now for each sentence, um, we need to split it into a list of tokens. So token is basically a data point uh, that the model will train and predict, okay? And um, this function tokenize um, will split a sentence into words or characters and return a list of split sentences. So it takes these uh, lines function that aligns um, um, list that we defined here. And then let's look at the first, first two tokens. So basically we will have this one and also this one. So basically the second line is just empty. All right, so we have this tokenized function too. Now we need to build the vocabulary. So the string type of the token is inconvenient to be used by the models. Um, so we need to build a dictionary or a vocabulary to map strings tokens into numerical indices starting from zero. In order to do this, we first count the unique tokens in all documents, which is called corpus, and then assign a numerical index to each unique token according to its frequency, okay? And um, if a token is rarely appeared, we can actually remove it from our corpus to reduce the complexity. Uh, or we can map them to a special unknown token. 
And we can also add some other special tokens like PAD for padding or, or BOS for, um, to represent beginning for a sentence or EOS to represent end of the sentence. So this um, count corpus actually will take, it will compute all the words from this list of lines that we had here. Okay, so it's going to, it's going to take the tokens that look like this and then create a counter that, that has the key values as the words and val or characters and the val uh, values as the, um, as the frequency of those tokens. So let's see, okay, I don't think we need this one here. Um, we don't need this one here. Okay, so let's look at the um, counter.items, how it looks like. Let's look at the first 10. Oh, sorry, I guess I didn't run this. Okay, sorry, I, apparently you cannot just look at the first 10 items. So basically this counter has all these words and the frequencies here, okay? Like the appears about 2000 times, time appears 200 and all that. Okay, and now let's sort them by their frequency. Okay, so you can actually just uh, run the, and just use this lambda function that does the sorting by the second variable. And you can also say reverse true. So see now we have the that appears as the most most uh, word, and then we have um, empty, we have a space, and then we have I, and so these are the top uh, top words or tokens here. Okay, guess we don't need to run it again, and now we can define a vocabulary class that actually takes these tokens. And also we may want to have some arguments. Let's, uh, let's talk about them later. So by taking the tokens, we actually compute the counter that actually returns, um, if you are working on words, uh, word and their frequencies. And then we can also uh, sort these uh, frequencies. I mean, so, uh, sort these uh, tokens by their frequencies. And then if your special tokens is true, we can actually add um, some new tokens. So for example, for unknown, for, for end of sentence, beginning of sentence and path. And also we need to assign some uh, numbers for each of these uh, special tokens. If we don't want it, um, we can only add this um, unknown because if, the, if there's a word that doesn't, um, doesn't uh, occur in the corpus, we can just assign zero value to it, or we can, um, we can uh, give that token as an unknown name. And then um, we can create our unique tokens by actually going through all of these um, tokens in, the, um, uh, in our counter. So remember here it goes we do for token and frequency in self token frequencies. We compute each token and add that to the unique tokens. And if the, but we do it only if the frequency of these are larger than some minimum frequency that we set here. So if it is too low, we may not want to add them. Okay. And then we also have these two important um, uh, parameters of this class. So one is index to token. So basically whenever you give me a number, I can tell you what word it represents or token to index. So whenever you give me a token, I can return uh, its index value. So index to token is a list and token to index is actually a dictionary. That's how we design it. And then for each token in our unique tokens, so these are all unique words, um, we append index to token 
um, we, sorry, we append this token to our index to token uh, list. So for example, the first word will be the um, first value of this, this uh, list and second word will be the second value in this list and so on. So basically when you give the index, uh, we can just um, look at the index in this, um, of this list to return the token. And now we also have this token to index. So basically whenever given a token, we can actually assign the value, uh, the index value to this token. And um, we also define this, um, this function as uh, whenever we call this LAN function, we want to return how many, uh, how many unique tokens it has. And uh, for any given token, if it is not a list, we can actually just look uh, from the dictionary, which was token to index. Remember, it is token to index is a dictionary. Um, and uh, return the index of that token. If, it is a, if tokens are list, then we run this function several times. And um, to tokens does just the reverse of this operation. So you give the indices and then we return you the tokens that correspond to those indices. And um, We, we already have this count corpus, but here we actually uh, flatten our token list. So instead of working on a list of tokens, um, sorry, instead of working on a list of token lists, we actually want to just uh, work on a list of tokens. So basically here each TK is going to be a word. And we return this um, dictionary that has the both uh, uh, token and also its frequency. Okay, so let's run this class. Okay, and now let's uh, construct a vocabulary with the time machine data set as the corpus and print the map between a few tokens to indices. So we get the token, so remember what our tokens look like. So it's actually a list of uh, list of tokens. So list of list of tokens, sorry. And when we give this, let's get um, the indices of each token for the first time. For example, um, the first token is unknown and its uh, index is zero. For the it is, um, uh, so we assign one to the token D and we assign two to the space character and so on, okay? So basically we just have this mapping between words and um, their indices. And we pick the indices based on their frequencies. And uh, then we can convert, convert any sentence into a list of numerical indices. So to illustrate this, let's print two sentences with their corresponding indices. So let's just pick um, tokens um, eight and then vocabulary of tokens uh, eight and also nine. So for example, here the words are the time traveler for so blah, blah. Then the indices that correspond to this sentence is this. So this is what we will be using for any kind of a model, right? And for example, for another word, words, so we have this and then the indices can be this. Okay. And um, now we can put all things together. Um, so we can have this function that returns corpus, a list of token indices and the vocabulary. Um, and uh, yeah, the modification we did here is that the corpus is a single list, not a list of token lists. Uh, and also for the tokenized function, you can actually have character instead of just the, the words. For example, what was the tokenized function? Let's go back to that. It was one of the first functions. So here, if 
if it is a word, we just split the lines. If it's a character for each line, we actually return a list of lines. So it, um, it uh, separates each word into character. So now our tokens can be, uh, can be characters. Because I'm using char here. And then um, we built the vocabulary using our tokens uh, that we computed from our read time machine. And we have our corpus and we return corpus and vocabulary. So, so you see that um, the length of the corpus is this much and vocabulary is 28. The reason why vocabulary is 28 is because we are only working on the characters. And um, let's also take a look into this. So if we look at the uh, uh, vocabulary token to index items, so basically we have uh, unknown characters to zero, map to zero. And there is also a um, space character that's mapped to one. And all the others are just the characters. So now we switch from words to characters. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay, I have one question. Okay, <laughs> all right, thank you. Okay, so next, um, let me share my slides instead. Okay, so going back to the slides. So these tokens that we have discussed can be viewed as a time series of discrete observations. Um, assuming the tokens in a length of, uh, in a text of length T are represented as X1, X2, X2, XT. So in the discrete time series, XT can be considered as the output or label of time step T. So think that um, this is your sequence of words. And let's say you want to uh, predict the word at X3. So you can uh, consider that X3 is like the output uh, of that uh, uh, um, output or label of time step T. And given such a sequence, the goal of a language model is to estimate the probability again. So it is like probability of X1, X2, all the way to XT. And uh, language models can actually be extremely useful. For example, an ideal language model would be able to generate a natural text just by uh, just on its own by drawing one word at a time. For example, if you know this probability um, and given the words W, T minus one all the way to W one, you can actually just ma just uh, sample from this distribution to generate new words or new uh, conversation. And the obvious question here is how we should model a document or even a sequence of words, right? So for this, let's start by applying uh, basic probability rules. So again, we want to compute this probability from word one, word two, all the way to word T. And we can use this um, uh, conditional probabilities uh, that product. For example, the probability of a text sequence containing four tokens let, uh, let's say statistics is fun um, uh, period, then you can say, you can actually represent this probability as probability of statistics times probability of given statistics, what is the probability of is, and times probability of fun given statistics is, and times probability of that given statistics is fun. So in order to compute the language model, we need to calculate the probability of a word given the previous few words, basically. And then probability of words can be calculated from the relative word frequency of a given word in the training data set. For example, 
uh, you can compute probability of statistics as the count of all occurrences of the word statistics and divide it by the total number of words in the corpus. And this actually works fairly well, uh, particularly for frequent words. And uh, if you want to compute this conditional probability, so what is the probability of is given statistics, you need to count all the occurrences uh, of statistics is divided by the number of all the occurrences with statistics. But, the, but estimating the probability of a word pair is actually more difficult than estimating just a single word because the occurrences of statistics is um, uh, is a lot uh, less frequent compared to a single word. And things, of course, get even worse for three word combinations. Um, and um, Laplace smoothing is, um, is kind of a way that adds a small constant to all accounts to, uh, to get, get away with these zero probabilities. Uh, but there might be some problems with this Laplace summating idea. First, we need to store all kinds of words. And second, it actually ignores the meaning of the verbs. So hopefully we can um, get away with these problems by using deep learning models. And uh, let's go back to our Markovian models. Um, and let's apply this to language modeling. So the distribution over sequences that satisfies the Markov property uh, can be written as this. So probability of um, word at t plus one given all the words equals probability of word t plus one given word at t. If we have this equality, then it is, um, uh, we, we call this, it's, it's uh, first order Markovian. Uh, and of course, higher orders correspond to longer dependencies. So if it is second order, then you will go, uh, this equation will be probability of wt plus one given probability of t, probability of t minus one. Um, sorry, th this part will stay the same, only this part will be different. So probability of word t plus one given word at t and word at t minus two, if it is second order. And uh, this leads to a number of approximations that we could apply to a model sequence. For example, if you want to model only four words, which is of course unlikely, but this is only for a toy uh, example. Um, so probability of W1, W2, W3, W4 can be written as um, you know, probability of each of these words. So this model, we call it as unigram. But if you have this uh, first order Markovian uh, property, then you can write this um, joint probability of four words, like probability of first word times probability of second word given the first word times probability of third word given second word and so on. And this, this model is called bigram model. And of course, if you have dependency on, on um, two words, we call this trigram. So this joint probability will be equal to first word's probability, second word given first word, third word given first and second, and fourth word given second and third. Realize that we don't have the second dependency for word two because we don't have any other word before that. So uh, we just use this first order condition. Okay. So now uh, let's open the other IPython notebook, which is um, in class nature language statistics. So I guess I need to say stop share here again. And open this one. Okay, so let's see how natural language statistics work on real data. And we still use this uh, time machine data that we just used in the other IPython notebook. So let's import all the packages we need. And uh, let's build the vocabulary. And if you look at uh, um, vocabulary, we actually have 
um, the is uh, occurred the most, of course, and then uh, space character and all that. So we are actually using the words for now, okay? Not the characters. And um, so as you can see, the most popular words are actually quite boring, right? So we have the and also space. Um, and they are often referred to as uh, stop words. And that's why they are filtered out but they still carry some meaning and we will use them nonetheless. Um, but uh, one thing that's quite clear from the word frequency is that it decays rapidly. For example, if you look at the 10th word, um, should we, let, let's actually uh, plot the frequency of these words. Okay. So these are the frequency of words in, um, in log scale. You see that they, they decay really rapidly. Okay, what about word pairs? So instead of using only one word, let's actually use the pairs. So we, we call them bigram tokens. In this case, for each line, we actually need to use this zip information. Basically, this goes um, uh, from the beginning of the line to the uh, one before last and the second one goes from the second item in the line to the uh, two before last. So it just uh, puts them together to create a um, uh, pair of words. And you see, so for example here, of the seems to be the most frequent word pair, which is 296 in the is the second word pair and so on and let's let's also do the trigram so in this case we need to go from for each line we need to go from the first all the way to the uh, third last and then from second all the way to the uh, second last and start from the second and all the way to the uh, end so this gives us all these um, not pairs, like a triple of words with their counts, but you see that it's of course getting less and less. So when we had the Unigram model, the most frequent word we had was about 2000. But when we have three gram, the most um, frequent token is 53. And let's actually visualize the token frequencies among these three gram models. So you see that they actually all um, all decay rapidly, but uh, it's um, it is uh, less rapid for trigram. But there are a lot uh, more uh, more pairs with very low frequencies in trigram. Okay, so this was for natural language statistics. Now let's go back to the slides. Okay, now, uh, uh, now go back to the iPod or no notebook and now let's uh, prepare the training data for our purpose. Okay, and now we will start talking about recurrent neural networks. Uh, okay, I need to stop share again. Uh, go back to the IPython notebook page. and open the training data preparation. Okay, so before introducing the model, let's assume we will use a neural network to train a language model. And now the question is how to read the mini batches of examples and labels uh, at random, right? So for this, uh, we are going to describe two strategies one is random sampling, the other one is sequential partitioning. So for random sampling, we will actually randomly generate mini batch from the data each time. 
uh, and uh, batch size indicates the number of examples in each mini batch and number of steps is the length of the sequence. So it is like how many words you want to input um, to your model and how many words you want to output. Okay. Um, and the positions of two adjacent random mini batches on the original sequence are not necessarily adjacent for this random sampling. Okay, um, and the target here is to predict the next character based on what we have seen so far. So the labels are actually the original sequences, but just shifted by one character. Um, okay, so I actually first want to clear the output for this. Okay. So let's import the libraries again. And uh, let's get uh, corpus and vocabulary. Uh, and let's get um, only third tokens. Okay, we don't, this is only for illustrating how, how we can prepare the training data for neural networks. And let's look at the first 10 corpus. So you see that these are just numbers now because um, each of them actually represents uh, one, uh, uh, one character. Now we are working on characters and here each, each index here represents a different character out of 26 characters. And you see that the length of the vocabulary is 28 uh, because it is 26 uh, characters in the alphabet plus um, space and unknown. And um, so here we can define this function that's called sequence data iteration random that takes the corpus that we defined here and uh, batch size and number of steps. So again, the number of steps is how many, uh, how many words or characters. So basically uh, just tokens to be more general, uh, how many of them you want to put, put into your model or you want to output. Um, so, so we can actually, so the important parts here are, uh, we have this example indices uh, that can go from zero to, uh, to number of examples times number of steps. And um, by, by, uh, by uh, jumping number of steps. And then we just shuffle this because we want to do random sampling. And we define this um, uh, function that we call data using this lambda from Python that actually just takes for any position that returns you uh, that position plus uh, all the way of number of steps from corpus. So basically this returns you a list uh, in your corpus, starting from position, ending at position at number of steps. And um, we have the number of batches and uh, for each I um, with um, batch size times number of batches with uh, batch size um, split, we can actually uh, define x and y. So x is actually the input to your neural network here and y is the labels. Okay, so it's going to be a lot more clear when we uh, run an example on this. But uh, what this function does is that every time we call it, it yields um, a mini batch that is both x and y. So let's run this. And uh, let's um, generate an artificial sequence from zero to 30, okay? So my sequence will be values uh, between zero and 30. So instead of having this corpus, uh, I'm going to have this zero to 30 to illustrate how this, uh, uh, how this uh, seek data, it's our random function works. And here the batch size is two and the number of steps is four. So basically it will, um, it will have four characters as an input. Okay, for example, uh, we run this, uh, we run this three times 
And in the, in the first case, so this is the first patch we have. Okay, sorry, uh, this is the first run that gives us, uh, sorry, this is the first batch with um, two samples at each. So in the, in the first batch, the uh, X will have just randomly initialized some values, but it, it's actually, um, it uh, starts with 11, but then since the number of steps is four, it takes four values, four adjacent values. And for the Y tensor, what we want to predict is going to be continuation of this, okay? So my input is 11, 12, 13, 14. And what I want to predict is 12, 13, 14, 15. For example, if my input is 19, 20, 21, 22, and my labels are going to be just shifted version of it. So basically we are just trying to predict the next character or a next word. And if you want to do sequential part, uh, partitioning, um, actually now we make the mini batches adjacent in the original sequence. So we start from the start of the original sequence and just keep moving. So the main difference between this and um, random sampling is that um, in the random sampling at each match, we just start from scratch. But um, here the Next batch is a continuation of the first batch. So let's see how this works. So you see um, in the first batch, the value of X is three, four, five, six. And in the next batch, it is seven, eight, nine, ten. In the next batch, it is 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, so this is more sequential. And uh, now we can wrap these two sampling functions to a class. So we can use it as a normal uh, PyTorch data iterator later. Okay, when we, when we go through the recurrent neural network of IPython notebook, we can actually just, um, um, just call this class. So this class takes batch size, number of steps, um, use random iterators. So basically, do you want to do sampling randomly or do you want to um, do the sequential sampling? And also maximum of tokens. Um, so we define data iterator function based on our selection of use random iterator. And then um, we define the corpus and vocabulary from our load corpus time machine function, which is in our utilities. Um, and also we define this get iter function as, um, as a function that returns the output of any of these uh, iterators. So if, if it is defined as the sequential one, it will call this function that will take the corpus and batch size and number of steps. So we can run this too. And uh, finally, we can define a function load data time machine that returns both the iterator and the vocabulary. So we can use it similarly as other functions. Um, so you can just have this function um, just to wrap things up. Okay, so we had the iterator for training but now what we need, what we are missing is actually the model. What kind of a model should we use to actually train a, a neural network? Okay, so I think I need to stop share here again and go back to the slides. Okay, we did this too. So in n-gram models, conditional probability of word xt depends on n minus previous words. So if you want to check the possible effect of words earlier than t minus n minus one on xt, we actually need to increase n. But if we increase n, then the number of parameters would also increase with exponentially. So rather than modeling this probability xt given xt minus one all the way to xt minus n plus one, it's actually preferable to use a latent variable um, so that instead of having xt given xt minus one all the way to x1, we can have xt 
given x t minus one and also the latent variable that actually um, uses the um, past information that the model learns. And here h t is the latent variable that stores the sequence information, and the latent variable is also called as hidden variable sometimes, or hidden state, or hidden state variable. So all these actually mean the same thing. And the hidden state at time t could be computed based on both input at x t minus one and hidden state h t minus one. So you can uh, represent it in an equation like this, h t is equal to some function of x t minus one and the previous hidden state h t minus one. Okay, and uh, actually recurrent neural networks are just neural networks with hidden states. So let's assume we have input data xt, which is um, n by d dimensional, and t here goes from uh, one to one to t, and here n is either the batch size or um, uh, or the entire data set. But it's, n is the number of samples we have, and d is the dimension of our inputs. And um, ht is, um, is the hidden variable of time step t with dimension n by h. So here, uh, n didn't change because we still have the same number of samples. But now instead of having dimension d, we actually have dimension h. And unlike multilayer perceptron, uh, here we save the hidden variable ht minus one from the previous step and introduce a new weight parameter that is called WHH, which is H by H dimensional, uh, that actually maps, um, that actually defines the mapping from previous hidden state to the current state. So basically the calculation of the hidden variable of the current time step can be written as this. So HD equals some function of the current input that's multiplied by some weight vector that we call weight XH, and also it uses the previous hidden state, h t minus one, but this time our parameters are w h h. And we also have some bias term. And uh, since the hidden state uses the same definition of the previous time step in the current time step, the computation of this equation uh, is recurrent. That's actually why it is called recurrent neural networks. And um, there are many different recurrent neural network construction methods. Uh, RNNs with a hidden state defined, just uh, defined in the previous slide um, is very common. Um, and for time step t, the output of the output layer is um, similar to the computation of MLP. So it actually takes the hidden state at ht and we multiply it by another weight uh, parameter, whq, and we add some bias um, vector. And um, uh, so basically, RNN parameters include the weight, WXH, and WHH, the BH, which is the bias term, and WHQ that actually maps the hidden state to output layer, and also a bias term for the output layer. Uh, and RNNs always use these model parameters even for different time steps. So if you notice, these um, weights and bias terms actually don't depend on T. Uh, that's why the number of RNN model parameters um, doesn't grow as the number of time steps increases. Okay, so this is how we can derive this. So here we can input uh, xt minus one and then we have the actually let's let's start with ht so this is the uh, this is the hidden state at ht that we defined an equation like this so it ta it takes xt um, and also ht minus 1 and that also adds a bias term and uh, we have the, the output ht and we pass them through this uh, uh, fully connected layer with some activation function uh, and for the output that goes here, uh, that we define as OT, we can actually uh, compute it by HT, the hidden state, times some weight plus bias term. And now um, 
we illustrate how RNNs can be used to build a language model. Let the number of mini batch examples be one for this toy example only, and the sequence of the text be the beginning of our data set, which is the time machine by HG Raz. So now, so this is my input, the time machine by H, and I want my output to be just, uh, just, uh, so imagine you just move this sentence by one word. So I want my output to be time machine by H G. And here the uh, number of steps we have is five because uh, our input is five dimensional. Uh, it actually, it, uh, we shouldn't call it the input is five dimensional because uh, uh, in terms of numbers, it might be different, but uh, here we want to put five tokens together. That's why, that's what we mean by number of steps. And we want to predict uh, next five tokens uh, using this input and also our recurrent neural network. And uh, now let's also discuss about how to measure the sequence model uh, quality. Uh, so one way is to check how surprising the text is. And of course, a good uh, language model uh, should be able to predict with high accuracy what we will see next. So for example, if you look at these three examples, um, so it is raining outside, that makes sense, right? It is raining banana tree, mm, I don't think your model worked that well. Um, it is raining P O K G J. Okay, I don't think this means anything. So this must be a really bad model. The second model at least had some English uh, structure, but the first one seems to be the best model, right? Or we can measure the quality of the model uh, by looking at the probability of each word given the uh, previous words. Um, so here, for some historical reasons, scientists in natural language processing prefer to use a quantity called perplexity that is defined as this. So let's try to understand what this measure really means in the best case, worst case, and baseline cases. So if your model is really good, this probability will be always one, right? And then uh, the entire expression will be zero. And then your perfect per, um, perplexity will be one. So in the best case, the value of perplexity should be one. In the worst case, this value um, will be, the probabilities will be close to zero. Then this value will, will be infinity and then uh, perplexity will be almost in infinity. What about you had a uniform model? So if you had a uniform model, th this probability will be one over n, right? So you have uh, one over n chance of picking each word. So if you have log of one over n here, uh, it will be uh, exp exponential of log of uh, log of n, which will be equal to n. So it will be the, uh, it will be equivalent to your vocabulary size. Okay, so in the most average case, your baseline should, uh, baseline for perplexity should be vocabulary size. And in the best case, it should be one. And in the worst case, it should be infinity. Okay, so now let's uh, open um, the notebook or um, RNS from scratch. Um, go back to the IPython notebook. Okay. So now we will implement a language model based on a character level RNN trained on this data, time machine data. And of course, we will start by reading the data set first. I'm also importing this utils uh, file that has all those uh, functions that we discussed in the other notebooks. 
And let's say our batch size is 32 and number of steps is 65, 64. So basically we want to put 64 characters together and we want to predict next 64 characters. And also by uh, calling this function, we get both vocabulary and also the iterator for training. So let's look at the output of this iterator first. So for example, one sample from this iterator is going to be, of course, two-dimensional because the first is going to um, have the information for X and the second is going to represent Y. So X is the input, Y is the label. And if you look at the shape of X, uh, it is 32 by 64. So 32 is batch size, 64 is the uh, number of characters that we want to uh, put together in the model. And we can also look at what they are. So these are just actually uh, indices of each character in our text file. Okay, so far we have uh, described our model using the indices. So basically each token is presented as a numerical index in this train iter. But feeding these indices directly to the neural network might make it hard to learn. And that's why we often present each token as a more expressive feature vector. And the easiest presentation is called one-hot encoding. So basically in a nutshell, we map each index to a different unit vector. So assume that the number of different tokens in the vocabulary is n, and the token indices range from zero to n minus one. So if the index of a token is integer, integer i, then we create this um, uh, EI vector that consists of all zeros with a length of n, except for the position i, which is set to one. And um, this vector is the one hot vector of the original token. Um, for example, let's say um, I have, um, uh, I want to represent um, indices zero and two as one hot encoding. And uh, I need, but I need to give the size of my vocabulary in order to represent it as a one hot encoding. And you see that the first one, zero is represented as a, as a vector, which is all zeros, but the first index. And the second one is also uh, another vector of zeros, uh, which is one except for the third index. And the shape of the mini batch um, we sample each time is going to be batch size times uh, time step. And the one hot function transforms uh, each mini batch into a 3, 3D uh, tensor. So here the last dimension equals to the vocabulary size. Okay. And we often transpose this input so that um, we, we can um, um, fit the sequence into models uh, easily. So basically, instead of having this batch size by time step by uh, number of vocabulary, uh, length of vocabulary, we will have time step by batch size by vocabulary size. So, um, for example, if, if I have X that uh, is an input that is uh, that has the shape of two by five, two is the batch size, five is the number of steps. And when I encode it using one hat encoding, um, but I, if I give the transpose of this input, I will actually have number of steps, batch size, and the vocabulary size. Okay. And all right, so next we need to initialize the model parameters for the recurrent neural network model. And the number of hidden units um, is a tunable parameter here. Um, so if you remember, so first we actually set the number of inputs, number of outputs to the vocabulary size. And then uh, we define this normal function that randomly initializes the parameters. And uh, remember we have this WXH um, weight and we also uh, initialize it with some uh, random initialization. And we have WHH and uh, bias term BH. And for the output layer parameters, we have WHQ and also the bias term B, BQ. And also 
we need to assign gradients to all of these parameters because we want to learn these uh, these parameters, right? That's why we say um, for each parameter, uh, param that requires grad equal to true. And now we return the parameters. So let's run this function, this get parameters. So to check if it is working, we can say params get parameters. Um, you see that the first one is 28 by three dimensional. So basically uh, the first parameter is WXH that maps uh, 28 dimension to, to hidden, hidden size, which we set as three. Okay. And um, for the RNN model, we first need an initial, um, we, we first need a function that initializes the state function to return the hidden state at initialization. Okay. Um, so it is right here. So basically it just returns zeros at the beginning. And this uh, RNN function defines how to compute the hidden state and the output in a time step. And the activation function we use is tan h. So it takes all the parameters that we have, okay? And we also have the state parameter. And for each x in the inputs, so remember here each x is a different step. So um, this is, so inputs is going to be number of steps by batch size by uh, dimension. and here, each x is going to be batch size times um, uh, times dimension. So basically, we are going through each t here. Okay, every time we compute compute new h t and new y t. Okay, so this runs the RNN function, and then uh, finally we can create a class that wraps these functions and store the parameters. So let's call it RNN model scratch. Uh, that has all the parameters we need. And let's run if everything works here. Um, so for the toy example we had, uh, with, and also the number of hidden is 512. So the shape of Y, which is the output, which is 10 by 20, 10 comes from number of steps, which was five, and batch size, which was two and um, the vocabulary size, okay? But the state size is uh, batch size times uh, the hidden dimension. Okay, so it looks like uh, dimensions are correct. So we looks like we, um, we wrote this code correctly. And now we can run the prediction function. Um, actually, we first explain the predicting function so we can regularly check the prediction during training. And this function predicts the next number of predicts characters based on the prefix, okay? And um, for the beginning of the sequence, we only update the hidden state. So basically in this for loop, we only update the hidden state. And then finally we um, output the, uh, we return the output. But when we return the output, we actually, look at their index, um, we look at the real tokens for those indices. So basically we use this vocabulary index to token function. Okay, for example, if I input time traveler, which is the prefix, and then if I say number of predicts as 10, so I want to predict next 10 characters, and let's say I have my model as RNN, and I, I also have the vocabulary, Let's see what this predicts. Time traveler, mo unku. Okay, doesn't make any sense um, because we didn't train the model yet, right? And uh, now before describing the training, let's talk a little bit about the gradient clipping. So for a sequence of length t, we compute the gradients over these t time steps in iteration, right? So that uh, results in a chain of matrix products with length uh, O of t during back propagation. And of course it might result some numerical instability because the gradients may either explode or vanish when t is large. Um, That's why RNN models need extra help to stabilize the training. 
Um, so we are going to talk about more mature uh, ways to do this next week. Um, but uh, for this class only, we can actually use this uh, simple fix that, uh, that actually just clips the gradients by projecting them back to a ball of a given radius. So by using this equality, um, you make sure that your gradient norm never exceeds this theta value. Okay, so let's define this gradient clipping function too. Basically here, we define the norm as the norm of all, all parameters. Uh, I mean, gradient of all parameters. And if norm is greater than theta, we actually just normalize them. We just clip them. And uh, finally, we can move to the training. Um, so we, we first define the function to train the model on one epoch, one data epoch. And it differs um, from the previous chap chapters in a sense that uh, we use different sampling methods for sequential data. Um, we, um, that will result in differences in the initialization of hidden states. And also we clip the gradient and also we use the perplexity to evaluate the model. So this function uh, actually just does the training for one epoch. So it takes the model and your training iterator and loss function you want and the um, updater, which is the optimizer, and also we have this option if you want to use random iterator or not. And these are just the metrics that uh, we can monitor. And uh, so in the train iter, we take each X and Y. And if state is not defined, we actually initialize the state. Um, so until you hit the last state, it's actually important to detach the gradients because um, in the last state, your last state already depends on the previous state. So you don't really need to um, compute the gradients for the, uh, for the states before you hit the last one. And um, these are the uh, outputs of your model. And as usual, we compute the loss and then um, we call the updater zero grads and we do the back backward propagation. And we also um, impl implement this gradient clipping and finally, we update the parameters. Okay, so let's run this. And uh, this train RNN just puts everything together. Um, so now we have uh, all epochs, and we also need to define this uh, learning rate and number of epochs, all those things. So let's see when the number of epochs is 500 and learning rate is one. Let's see if our model can actually learn uh, from this really tiny image data set. Okay. So now we, we are monitoring the perplexity. Okay, here we, all, we can also see the prediction. Okay, time traveler, the, 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 I don't think that makes any sense. Hopefully it will get better, but it is good that the perplexity is actually uh, getting down, it's decreasing, so it's also good. But it's the time traveler, it's still, okay, now we have and the, the. Okay. All right, I hope we can get something meaningful at some point. Okay, this is different. The time traveler and oh, now it went back to and and and. At least it looks like English sentence. Let's see where it is going to stop. And imagine, so given time traveler, we are trying to predict all these uh, extra characters. And our data set is really, really small. Okay. All right, it's getting more interesting. I don't know if it makes 
in the sense yet. Hmm. We are almost there. Okay, this, this sentence makes sense a little bit. Okay, with a slight account, sure, but. And imagine we are only learning from the characters. So it's actually already incredible that it can have this English language grammar. Okay, I think it's getting better, at least more meaningful, and our perplexity is getting much better too. Okay, so time traveler with a slight accession of cheerfulness, really, okay, not bad, right? Um, so this was the illustration of RNN from scratch. Of course, uh, many uh, deep learning frameworks have their, um, their libraries that you can directly use RNN, but I think it is really empowering to be able to implement this by yourself. Um, any questions so far? I can stop sharing. Okay, let's see. new message more questions okay um, so next week we will continue with um, with um, more sophisticated uh, natural language processing models um, and um, also your uh, proposals are due next week but let me know if you have any difficulties uh, with your situation right now and uh, yes, yeah, stay home and stay healthy. So see you next time. Thank you.